I hope that you enjoyed your lunch well and after the lunch hour we usually uh, feel a little bit sleepy but I want you to be focused more on this important topic. Uh, this is the guideline which was uh, discussed in the US and Europe and Japan and also implemented in these areas which is E14. So I want to talk about the revision of the ICH E14 guideline today. So uh, there are four topics that I want to cover for today, ICH and the safety pharmacology studies. I will introduce a little bit of them and then I will focus on the ICH E14 SS7B revision and case studies will be also shared and then I will be uh, talking about the recent interest in Korea well, actually, this type of a study has been already done in other countries, but it's a recent interest in Korea, which is the combined toxicity study with SP study. So there are some terms that will be frequently uh, mentioned during the presentation at 7 b uh, of course, E13, M3, S6, S9, S13, oligonucleotide ICH guideline uh, has been recently uh, introduced oligopeptide S13. And that part will be uh, discussed in the final concept paper of S7B. So oligonucleotide and S7B and E14 usually uh, cover NCE, but here new protein biologics and oligonucleotide will be covered here. So that will be mentioned briefly during the presentation, receive a TQT, clinic apart, uh, talk about the TQT and TDP, delayed ventricular repolarization, and QTC, of course. The QTC is a corrected value, QT and QTC. So all the reports uh, usually have these terms. And as for the clinical section, Risk assessment and the management are often cited as a 7B guideline actually mentioned this part. So the study here actually is a very significant, but it has not yet been that much of a case in Korea. So I will talk about it too. As a 7B, when we conduct a study under the SS7B, uh, the result, whether it is a double negative or non-double negative, the scenarios for that will be explained. And best of practice, which is related to the GLP, will also mention core battery, follow-up study, NCE, which is the new chemical entities. So this is basically chemicals implemented and implementation and regulatory decision making FIH. So these are the terms that I will uh, often mention during my presentation. So let me start about start with the introduction of ICH and safety pharmacology study. Um, people often hear about S7B, but we do not know much about the safe pharmacology studies. We usually talk about the repeat dose uh, toxicity study. So I want to explain a little bit more about this. See this gentleman on the slide, looks very handsome. This is the professor, Gernard uh, uh, Zavindin, who talked about the safety pharmacology. So repeat uh, those toxicity and these kind of concepts were first introduced uh, by this uh, professor. So as for the Safety Pharmacology Society, actually this professor is a father of modern safety pharmacology. So I just wanted to show this person. And this is actually taken from a textbook. I think the uh, when we talk about the safety pharmacology, uh, you can see that there are a bit different ICA uh, guide, guidelines like S7A uh, and B and E14 and S7B in 2015 and also 
when I was a student, the GLP uh, study was conducted quite a lot at schools, but now the GLP studies only can be performed by the CRO with a certification. And in 2012, the the MFDS uh, produced a guideline on the safety pharmacology testing. And afterwards, like after 2010, and after like 2014, SS7B guideline was introduced. And more recently, the, this guideline was updated. And SS7C will cover the abuse or a separate guideline need to be established for the abuse is something uh, under discussion because cardiac toxicity, how much, uh, and that is has quite addressed to a certain extent. So whether the misuse or abuse, it should be a part of the C as a part C or should be established as a separate guideline as in the case of the oligonucleotide. So the working group is already formed to uh, discuss that issue. So SS7B uh, guideline, as you can see, shows this uh, diagram. Actually, this is the start of the approach, as you can see, and then it has been modified and revised later on. And if you look at this, Step two and step four, this is in 2004. There are two parts under step two. And we are the member of the ICH committee. But when I first uh, was involved into this field, there was a EU, PMDA, and MHLW, and FDA. So there were only three to four uh, organizations only, and they have their own issues of interest. So here at the step four, these are the step four area. So if you look at the step four, whether this is needed, then EU and the uh, Japan, they said it is needed, but FDA says it's case, but by case. But if you look at this at the step four, it is almost all cases. And for the E14, here case by case, and this all, and at the end of the day, case by case. But at that time, for E14 was quite strongly led by FDA, but as later on, E for E14 TQT, It requires about $4 million, and it's only like 2010. So if it's in now, then it should cost more. So that was also one of the uh, issues. So for this part, the CV, telemetry, APD. For APD, well, current guideline, The GLP need to be approached now, but at the time, in the past, that was not under the GLP scope. So the reason for this part to be included is that for step one, two, three, four, during the process, these three parts work very hard. And then step four uh, was out as a conclusion. For this part, I will mention later on. In 2022, the ICH, when the guideline was revised, I think these two organizations and this organization actually had a difference uh, in op their opinions. And when I visit the Congress in uh, Vancouver, uh, there was a person from Elia Lilly, and he was very extensively explaining why he is opposed to this idea. But FDA personnel said that the continuing education during the continuing education course, the FDA is, up, is for this process. So what I'm trying to say is that for some organizations here, we're accepting some ideas here, but for other areas like the pharmaceutical industry, because of the cost concern, they didn't like to have that in the uh, guideline. But from the FDA perspective, it, it was not. Still, the cardiac related iron channel need to be studied. Uh, that's what I heard from the Congress that I participated. 
So, in the textbook, I think these discussions will be uh, explained in the textbook later on. At 7B, uh, I think I refer to this textbook a lot in my presentation. In 2020, uh, the webinar, this is the uh, material from the webinar in 2020. For the INDs, for the uh, FDA, at least 20% show prolongation. And certain uh, materials, substance for the oncology, 33%. So when I do a study, I don't know how it is, partic it is included in the IND, but still, 20 to 30 percent of the study that I do or my team does uh, see the prolongation, QT uh, prolongation. So, FDA application itself is possible still, even though there is a QT prolongation, but I will explain it later on. So, ICH. E14 and S7B, I will just explain them. So here is the uh, the content from the step two in 2020. So here you can see that of the topics discussed in 2020, there was a discussion to eliminate E14. In the webinar, E14, elimination of the E14 was also discussed. However, this is not the case now. Although some part of the E14 is not strengthened, but still the number of the cells or the per persons or the participants has been decreased a little bit. In the revision of the uh, 2004, there was more about the non-clinical study, ion channel telemetry study, TQT, so they were not uh, shown at the time. In 2020 webinar, that was quite late in Korean time. And I was very shocked when I watched this webinar because it is called as ignored. These data here were ignored. They were unnecessary data but one of the data for IND. For TQT, there was an issue about it. Imperfect biomarker, the TQT was an imperfect biomarker. So these are the ones where uh, improvement need to be made. So for the step two, what was discussed was that as the 7B data, it's not ignored. For TQT phase three, the number of the participants is reduced or it, it can be waived or just proceed to the labeling right away. So that was the main uh, discussion during the time. And here all negative and positive signal. I mentioned some terms already, the scenario non-negative non-double negative scenarios are, are, are actually related to this part. In step 4, 2022, this provides the summary of the step 4 in that time. So you can see some detailed summary. SS7B guideline or the bar diagram of the previous version, you can see sodium calcium here that was not there before. Hawk channel and telemetry, these were the only ones that existed in the previous version. Whether it is a core battery or not, actually no. The follow study, it is a follow study and the ion channel study is needed. And here, myocyte, the human myocyte, embryonic or other adult uh, stem cell. So that can be utilized for the myocyte study. In here, the follow-up study is conducted. 
And for E14, it is mentioned here too. So reduce the number of the clinical trial. It's the one that is mentioned in the summary. So the number of the participants, like 30 to up to like 100, so that number can be reduced or the study itself can be waived. And for the TQT, when there is a TQT study is incomplete, then SS7B, how SS7B can integrate this? This is also explained. The ignore the data was mentioned in the previous uh, slide and here the integrated TQT data, when the TQT data cannot be used fully, then SS7B data can be integrated and can be used. And uh, SS7B E14 is this uh, is has the following uh, table of contents uh, as a part of the uh, Q&As. And however, uh, methodology and the study design, well, uh, study design is actually, oh, there is a Q&A part from 2012. And the methodology, gender, and the positive control were developed back in 2008. And number five, six, seven are the ones that have been included this uh, in the latest E14 uh, S7B Q&A documents. And the risk assessments and the best practices uh, for in vitro and in vivo uh, studies on the And the, the models, uh, their uh, relevant Q&As are included in the latest uh, Q&A documents. And then there's the training uh, material. And at the top part, so on the uh, left-hand side, there's the question. On the right-hand side, there's the answer. And it's very descriptive. And because it's descriptive, it may be uh, difficult to get the gist of the uh, information. But if you look at the training materials, there are diagrams or the figures, and they uh, may be um, useful in understanding. And so if you uh, believe these uh, uh, the tables and the figures in uh, insufficient, then you can refer to uh, the, one, the documents that I mentioned uh, previously. And so this is the uh, the table of contents, and uh, they show uh, here in the revised. They first talk about the revised E14 and Q and A's. However, in the uh, previous uh, slide, uh, there are these parts. So these parts, that is number five and six, I uh, will talk about them uh, briefly. So uh, let's look at the answers first. I think that would be easier for you to understand how the document is organized. And first is related to uh, to reading. And so cardiologists as well here it describes as readers. So these are skilled readers and these skilled readers I needed. And it's not just one, but a few of readers I needed. And also there has to be low variability and high uh, consistency for a reading. And for that, a lot of uh, training is needed. That's what's uh, discussed in uh, the first uh, Q&A. And how to read? Well, well, there could be automatic reading. And there could be a manual a reading or half a manual or half automatic reading. But this is something that was uh, from 2008 documents. So whether it's a fully manual or automated reading, well, there was some description about this. But now uh, it's been changed to a full, uh, fully automated. Uh, telemetry is, is also same is applicable to the telemetry. And so there's that difference. And 
And so this was how it used to be in the past. And at that time, this was in a, a sufficient. And that is why uh, this has been uh, changed in the latest uh, QA. In the past, a fully manual was uh, recommended in the guidelines. However, nowadays, uh, it's been changed to automated reading. And about uh, QT and the T wave uh, morphology. And there's the uh, guidance about them here. But now, uh, the guidance is about the automated ECG of uh, reading. But at that time, by reading this, you can say, oh, well, in the past, so there were uh, a validation needed. So there were some uh, mentions about the automated ECG reading. And so you could just understand that in that way. So that, and also about the methodologies here. And in the new methodology, uh, what needs to be done? Well, that's described here. But as I just said, now it's all automated ECG reading, so it doesn't not really. It's not really uh, applicable. And methodology, well, it describes about the automation. It doesn't have uh, much about the manual part because we need automation in order to do the experiments uh, quickly. But if the ECG uh, recording, uh, it's not going to be done uh, manually. It's all going to be done automatically. And so that we can detect uh, irregular morphology of ECG uh, quickly. And that in order to do it so quickly, we do need automated uh, methods. So that is why such a method uh, or methodology is emphasized. And about uh, C, uh, it represents a uh, corrected. And if that is F and B, those corrected values. And that is, uh, this is a recommendation of uh, made by a person by the name of Bizet. Well, that was the recommendation back in 2008. But now for both animals and humans, uh, the following equation or the following uh, methodology is applied. So RR and heart rates uh, can be uh, used with the, uh, the corrected values. But they can also be uh, cited for the beta value, QTCI or the QTCA, they could be utilized for uh, and can be automated in accordance with the uh, formula or the equation, as you can see, to do the uh, QT uh, prolongation cal uh, calculation. And so, how to do uh, 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 the TQT, uh, TQT study? I don't think you can read this uh, from uh, when in the back. And I think the minimum could be uh, smaller. Uh, some would be 96, some would be 54. So it could be smaller uh, than 60. So that is, I'm talking about the end. So this is related to gender. So 450 millisecond or 500, and so uh, that is uh, the range given here. But this could be different per person. It could be different between two dif uh, two gender, that is men and women. And that was an issue back in 2008, but that's not an issue right now because we now accept the fact that there is a difference between genders and among the people. And here they give ideal uh, uh, numbers. And that is a reference here. And about the positive uh, control of the, uh, the drug for the uh, to confirm the positive controls, uh, this uh, information is utilized. By reading, you may be confused, but what it means ultimately is that this can be applied for both men and women, and this is not included uh, in the uh, the uh, the materials uh, that you have uh, received anyway. This is apl applied for men and women, and it's not mandatory, but there has to be sufficient number of population uh, secured. It has to be in thousands. But for repetitive uh, toxicology, 
as a few, a certain number of uh, people or the population has to be of uh, secured, but that's not the case here. But for the uh, QT analysis, you need this much people. And this is a uh, text from 2015, 2016. I think that was about, about 4 million. And about uh, positive control. And uh, so this is uh, from uh, 2008. So why was this information uh, contained? And that is to uh, get a sensitivity. And so, and so they have to use a, a positive control that has a sensitive of more than five millisecond of prolongation. And so, how do we cl uh, clarify this? Well, a double-blinded a positive control is not uh, necessary here. However, a blinded me uh, method has to be used, uh, that is, and also the clinical uh, protocol, the positive uh, control uh, can, uh, for them, uh, the, uh, the uh, blood taking or the ECG measurement would be same as test drugs or the placebos. And about uh, study design. And it, this is uh, about you know, how the study should be designed. And so it would be better for you to uh, read uh, the red texts here. At different QTC points, uh, you could uh, compare the mean QTCs of a placebo at each time point. And the mean uh, and also uh, there's a mention about baselines and uh, has to be described in, in the uh, clinical trial uh, protocol. There are two types of uh, baselines. One is time matched and the other is a pre -dose. This is very similar to animal tests. Here we use of a parallel as well as a cumulative. But uh, crossover means that is for, is so, uh, so cumulative is that one gets a less and the other gets more. And so it has to be either a parallel design or the, uh, the, uh, the cumulative design. And here the data that is used is the pre-dose data uh, for the crossover, excuse me. And for the parallel design and the baseline that is used is time matched. So that is uh, the difference. And this is very similar to the telemedicine related clinical trials. And this is E14 of fifth item, and this is related to a QTC. And uh, this is the revision part of a revised part of the E14. As you can see, there is uh, a description about the concentration of response model. In the past, uh, the TQT model was used, but that's not uh, no longer the case. Here, a uh, uh, concentrated response analysis before the, uh, the revision, in vitro and in vivo data uh, were uh, included, but now TQT plus and the in vivo data are uh, combined in order to uh, draw uh, conclusions. And uh, this is well included in the materials. Uh, so please uh, read uh, this document at your leisure, please. For six, which is about special cases, for TQT result, there are cases where we cannot utilize the conventional TQT study. So it's a certain cases. So placebo controlled comparison is not possible or safety or tolerability prohibit the use of the product in health participants where the safety consideration preclude administering a supra therapeutic dose to obtain high clinical exposures. So in these certain cases, uh, what we can do?
S7B data has been, can be used here in the decision making. QNS S7B point, uh, 1.1 and 1.2. In vivo and in vitro, best considerations are mentioned in here. So the data for this part is non-negative. If it's non-negative, then even though the data is not sufficient for this part, the TQT, uh, for the TQT, the decision making can be done. Another uh, part of the special cases here, well, this is quite often uh, mentioned. For example, the repeated toxicity is only is conducted for the combination drug products. But as you know, already the labeling in the market is done. So when it comes to the safety, of course, the safety is secured. But when they are used for the combination therapy, then do we have to do uh, the study for the combination uh, drug products? So this part explains very well for that. The answer is no, there is no necessity to do the study again for the combination drug product. So for the protein monoclonal antibody, S13, if you look at the S13 oligonucleotide, is also mentioned. For that part, the the correlation is low, and this is the core concept paper S7B. If you look at the website for that on the right side upper part, uh, you can find a concept paper. May this year, uh, I believe that that was the time for the concept paper was published. And the website started to share it online during, from a summer. And in that concept report, actually, the concept paper provides some more information on this special case. So whether we have to do it or not. And as I said before, S7B, E14 covers NCE, the chemicals, biologics, oligonucleate. It's a case by case. And for the combined repeat toxicity, if it's possible, then how we can approach? So these are the ones uh, that are discussed in this part of the uh, guideline. For number seven here, at the late stage, so there is a monitoring. And there are six recommended intensity of monitoring and assessment, like QT prolongation. And when the QT prolongation uh, is maintained. In these cases, at the later stage, there is a need for the monitoring. And I was not able to uh, include all different examples basically four examples into this slide, but you can refer to the guideline. For more details, and if you are interested more in this area, then you can refer to the guideline for the specific examples that I were not able to include in this slide. And I think I have about like 45 minutes left. For S7B, there are more things that we need to talk about compared to E14. There are more topics to be covered. Number one of the S7B, the Q&A number one, is that from the summary part that I mentioned, the integrated risk assessment, it can be done. If it's not there, like the TQT is not sufficient, then E7, uh, S7B data can be used for E14, so the risk assessment can be done as an integrated approach. So we can reduce the dependency on the data of the QTC, and then the pharmaceutical companies can reduce the cost. And I mentioned briefly, there are two scenarios, non-clinical study, when we have a non-clinical study, and 
how we can make the decision for the clinical one. One scenario is negative. Here you can see and or. One of these is positive. If that is the case, how we can make a decision on it? If it is all negative, then TKT, the number of the participants can be reduced or the waived and then um, directly impact on the labeling. But what if we have a positive from in vivo or in vitro? How we can judge it? And when we do the TQT, what we can do? The number of the TQT just maintained as it is before, or do we have to change it? So that is explained in this part. And what about the safety margin? For QT in vivo and in vitro best practice. And this is explained in here. And for the 3R, of course, the 3R uh, prim uh, principles can be applied here. For integrated risk assessment, negative and positive, as I mentioned, the 3Rs, of course, uh, can be considered. And CMAX, the Huck margin, when it is calculated, how we can make that calculation. I says 50, how can it? be interpreted and approached from the best practice perspective in vitro and in vivo for both the best practice. It's highlighted very much in S7B, the best practice in the S7B. And actually, I sometimes a little bit confused about that because, you know, at the end of the day, the knowledge or the skills of analysis, analysis or the analyst should be more in-depth than just the common knowledge utilizing the GLP approach. CMAX or the TMAX are very important. The materials, if you look at them, the CMAX and the TMAX, if we do not have them, I have that kind of a case quite often. Like, why don't you just do the telemetry study? This is our substance and no CMAX or the TMAX provided. Well, but now, if you look, refer to this guideline, it cannot be done in that way. If we, there is no PK data, then the CMAX or the TMAX need to be there. And, of course, low, middle, high, those need to be checked and the telemetry animal need to be done in parallel after the study. The PK data at a certain point need to be the blood is taken and the response concentration need to be provided. For non rotten dose and our dose, sometimes, many times they are similar. In that case, for TK data, we can utilize that data. However, if it's not the case, so the non rotten data, we don't have the non rotten data, then pharma companies or the developing companies may have some difficulties. So for in vitro best practice, continues in this section. So here the recording temperature should be set between 35 to 37 Celsius degree. I'm just wondering why this temperature is provided, the room temperature and the hog and iron curve shows 2 to 30 uh, percent difference. So scientific literature for this was published in like early 2000. So it has been like 20 years since then. I'm not, and when it comes to the recording temperatures of 35 to 37 Celsius degree, I think it's all still maintained and still applied at the CROs or the uh, pharma companies. And for the protocol, the protocol is fixed. In the past, it was not. It can be different from one organization to another. So potassium current, it's out of current. 
it can be minus 40 or minus 50 Celsius degree where it is inactivated, but it can be different from one organization to another. But now, the recommended recommendation was made by the FDA. So now we have the protocol. Publish it. So if you look at this journal, then you can find more details about the protocol. How potassium current in in order current calcium and sodium channel. There are two for the sodium channel. The channel is one single one, but there are two assays. Late peak. This is the late peak, and this is a simple peak. Or sometimes people call it as an early peak. It is close to this part. But anyway, for this late peak, the drugs for this late peak, there are certain drugs close to this late peak. So when we have the positive control, we do the testing on it with the positive control. So there are four ion channel uh, studies to be conducted and all different uh, part of the or the stages of the protocol need to be uh, followed. But for the resting membrane, potassium need to be measured in resistance and the holding current need to be measured. If you know a little bit about this resting membrane, usually minus 90 uh, millivolt. For this potential, it can drop or it can be maintained. It depends on the technique of study and input resistance The pore size is important. Sometimes the pore can be clogged. The input resistance can change in that case. And for the holding current, sometimes if there is a leak, electrode and the cell, when in the connection area, there can be some leak between that. If there is a leak, then holding current will be widened. In the scientific literature, we can find that in 2004, and that is also mentioned in our routine uh, journals or the uh, references. However, with the revised guideline, that should be specified in the appendix. The single cell related ones need to be included in the appendix. So it takes a lot of time for our team to set on this because this is not simple. Actually, to include this part into the GLP program, uh, that was not very easy for us. But fortunately, we were able to complete it. So CROs or the pharma companies, I think they need to pay close attention to this part. Otherwise, the response of the cells or the current techniques because of those things here, whether the current is inhibited or not, uh, cannot be fully confirmed. And this is very important. With the, uh, because of the certain uh, drug, the current is not inhibited. And because of the leak, the current can be widened. But still, it can be interpreted as inhibition. So for each day, uh, study, we, you need to have the data on this. This is the formula for the IC50. From 0 to 1, but it can be like 0 to 100. What is important is that IC50 in the past was either way, but micromolar need to be applied here, nanogram per ml, need to be specified, and heal for efficient need to be included. Heal coefficient is really important here. The slope, when we calculate the slope, the slope between 20 and 80 percent, you know that the hemoglobin has four uh, oxygen molecules, but with the Hill equation, it would be only 2.7 and 3.0, which means here, 1.2.1. So with a slope, the binding affinity can be predicted. 
So this is critical. This part need to be uh, included. This is not easy uh, task to do. So Hill equation, in order to calculate that, 20 to 80% current inhibition is important. The Hill plot can be calculated when we have at least 70%. It fits like a 50% or 60%, it's not easy. So it can only provide estimate, it's not right. So binding affinity, how much molecules can be bound, we cannot show that, but still between 20 and 80%, Hill coefficient can be calculated and the numbers can be provided based on that. So that is a very important uh, part to be remembered. And sodium channel, potassium channel, calcium channel. So these three need to be applied with this an ion one chemical. And Uh, this is not something that we do on a regular basis, but uh, when there's no uh, binding affinity, we uh, do injection of the, uh, the drug substance. And so uh, we are to analyze a different uh, drugs with different uh, injections. And here, uh, we see, uh, you know, how much could be uh, val uh, validated. And there's something about uh, uh, terfenadine. Here it's about 100%. Here on the other side, you see about 70 to 80%. In our experiment, the terfenadine, its uh, binding affinity was really, really high. So it, to wash it out uh, took uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, so we had to change uh, the chambers that we were using. Uh, but we have to get the ICPT. So there will be two ICPTs, ICPPT data here. And then uh, because there's a binding affinity. And here there will be lower. And here we would have to get ICPT. So we have to get these two values. Uh, one is 1.4, 1.4, and here about 17.4. And, and in on, on the pre uh, in uh, case there is about a 37.5 percent and in the past we used to use a stock solutions but that is not possible now uh, we have to use the NT solution and so UPLC or the HPLC or the LC uh, mass are utilized here and according to the relevant uh, guideline uh, we do experiment with the LC and MS and so uh, the sponsors don't like this because this is most costly. Anyhow, so this is what has changed and about uh, positive uh, controls. Here we do not uh, need to only do the test uh, so, uh, with the sufficient replicates and two or more concentration that achieve 20 to 80 percent of block. So the test articles provided by the company, the ICPPT, has to be calculated. And for that, we need to get a positive control values. So that means there's going to be quite a, a lot of volume. So a lot of tests will have to be done. And uh, for the uh, positive control, with, uh, when we do tests with the positive control, it doesn't really take us much. However, now at the request of the of the uh, the sponsors and if it's going to be provided to FDA then we need to use the updated version which means that it would take about 2 3 times more than it used to be so it's not easy so the ICPT uh, calculation is also not so easy here and let's look at uh, Q&A 2.2 and this is related to in vitro studies. And this involves uh, cardiomyocytes. Uh, 
we could do electrophysiology with uh, cardiomyocyte. It is possible. However, uh, cardiomyocytes has excellent uh, cell uh, intensive uh, in, uh, intensity, and so with cardiomyocytes. Uh, when we do a manual patch, uh, the binding is not easy because the other cell lines, they have a good affinity. In, in 10, 20 minutes, uh, they do attach to the bottom of the, uh, the glass container. And with the micro, so we could utilize micro electrode to, uh, to do uh, the work, but uh, the cardiomyocytes, they, they move around. And but at some schools utilize I may mean, use cardiomyocytes to do this sort of test and i think that's quite amazing I, mean, I think that uh, the data they get is very similar to the data that we have and so anything the the thing that is related to cardiomyocyte is related to ma uh, study and so it talks about how to do uh, that particular study so ma study it's well described in the papers. It's when uh, uh, it talks about what happens when a positive uh, control is used, and there uh, there could be an issue related to calcium, and uh, also uh, here we can see how the action potential works. If the experiment is done properly, uh, we use uh, com company ends as well as company H from another countries. Uh, uh, products where they do have a strength and weakness. So on, with the micros, we do see the bumping occurring. But the time now if the, which we can utilize is not much. And because these are the, uh, the cells that whose uh, uh, destination is ne already there. And so within a given time, so for the CRO, for the pharma company or the they need to get at the optimal at time points and no matter how many plates you use at least one uh, if one can be uh, set up uh, even just one plate i think the experiment itself would not be too uh, difficult and about the uh, the origins, uh, there are two or three of uh, organization in Korea that provide us uh, such uh, cells, and because the, there could be some difference in terms of the pumping, and so there's uh, we have looked at the, the uh, product from two different companies. Uh, there was not much difference in terms of data, but uh, the uh, the one from uh, the foreign companies in terms at low doses there was a bit of sensitivity for the Korean product compared to H product at high doses there was not much difference, but at low uh, uh, concentration where well, the sensitivity was uh, lower and we could uh, uh, check this uh, with the data. And uh, in terms of methodology. Of course, you have to make sure that the, the right methodology is utilized. Of course, you need here, it talks about uh, what needs to be uh, recorded. Well, unless you have actually done this, uh, me telling you all this would not really make you make sense to you. So you have to have the device, uh, the equipment. And with the uh, cardiomyocyte the cells, you have to do the culturing. And you would learn that the, uh, the incubation or the culturing is quite different uh, from other uh, cells. But you still would know that the recording uh, is still uh, possible. And uh, there are uh, several protocols that could be uh, applied here, but according to uh, so the literature that I've mentioned, this is well uh, described. And the protocol that we use is, as you can see here at the bottom. And so well-to-well -well, 
uh, comparison is not possible. So if you have a one well, you have to continue to use this, and we have to you have to continue to record what has happened in the well, and then you process it, and then you record it for about an air, uh, hour, uh, and then you uh, change the concentration, increase decrease the concentration, and then you do the recording. So with the protein assays, you have different wells. And then you do scraping, and then you get the quantification of the proteins, and and you see that things have changed. And this, but with the MA test, it, the same well, the same well, and then with there the test articles or the or the drugs are continuously added, and so the final concentration could be different. But there's something that needs to be considered. If the if the drugs are is uh, dissolved with the DMSO, it is excellent for the delivery of the drugs. But they also melt uh, cell membranes, and so therefore it cannot be shaken. Uh, with the we have experience with the Western um, uh, brass. And if you have done a lot of experiments with the cell lines, you know this. You do a lot of shaking, but the cells, are the, uh, sometimes the cells are not uh, dropped. But when here, the, the binding affinity is not so strong, so therefore the cells just uh, fall off. And so between the wells, alongside the you have to do this along the wall and it has to uh, you have to move up and down very slowly and how well you do this uh, will result in whether you have the data or not and this is something that you require a lot of uh, know -how. I mean we had a lot of trials and errors ourselves and anyway uh, uh, this is the protocol that we came up with in order to have uh, the cells for us to do the testing and there is uh, limited information about this, but uh, please refer to uh, the references uh, that I have mentioned, and they could help you to better understand uh, this uh, question. And in case of uh, this is some, uh, 4031 is quite well known. And, and uh, so maxillotin. Uh, this is the ECG here. This is something that has been expanded here. The black part is the the baseline. Uh, this is very similar to the QT prolongation, and because they do the bidding, and so this is the same number as the bidding in humans, beating so about forty to sixty, and but the QT prolongation is same. So with this uh, drug, there will be a shorting, shorting, excuse me, and then there's the prolongation, and that is uh, checked here. And this is something that is used for the sodium channel. So this is black here. And so if the 10 micromolar, it will decrease like this. And that will decrease the action potential. And so that is the kind of uh, difference. But in, uh, anyhow, if you do the MA test like this, and we do acute prolongation for the telemetry. And so it may uh, seem the same uh, or different. And so you have to look at in vivo and in vitro uh, separately. And uh, about uh, telemetry studies in the best practices for that, what sort of species should be used? And 93% are a monkey or NHP, but also a large number of use of dogs. So probably uh, these are the most appropriate uh, species. And you, and you could use the same animal as species. And for the same uh, pharmacology study, PK and PD data, if they are not available, and when you're the telemetry study, you have to use a same animal or the telemetry animal at the same time. In the telemetry study, uh, you measure the ECG after taking the drug, but after uh, the uh, interval is over, you give the same drug, and if the same num and then you have to get uh, the uh, blood taking points. And we would be with the same as the time points as the uh, the PK and or the C mix or the T mix 
points of uh, showing time point and the ones that are before and after that and pretos that is the cmex tmex point so there would be about four or five uh, time points they should be enough and when they're not available those time points are not available the experimentation time would be longer therefore the cost would also go up as a result so now as you know well uh, it should be used for the uh, cross oval and at least four animals need to be used and you can refer to the uh, scientific literature here that i am sharing on the slide and for the dose setting actually this is for the uh, dose setting for the clinical study so pk animal it's not about like pk animal data it's for the human data in Korean situation, actually, it's not easy to do, but for the overseas cases, the clinical data, when the clinical data is needed, when we request for that, and then that kind of a data can be provided quite easily. But in Korea, it's not easy to get this type of data. So it's quite limited data for us, but still, when the dose is set, the higher dose or the including dose, and these things need to be covered. And in Q&A 5.1 and 6.1, uh, you can find the highest clinical exposure that can be covered. And as I said before, in the same animal, the PDPK study can be conducted. And also 3R, of course, uh, need to be complied. And for the blood sampling, the relevant time points are needed, and as I said before, the CMAX before CMAX and uh, after CMAX and pre dose. So, in the same animal, you know, the animal can be more active. So, in the case, as you can read, like 30 uh, minutes after that time point can be also okay. So ECG telemetry data, of course, that is more important. The PK data is about like response. But if the blood is taken before, then the animal will take more time to be stabilized. So ECG data can have some noise. So it's not easy to obtain good data for this. So let's say if it's like two hours, then it can be done at 2 hour and 30 minute like that. So you can consider that too. So response and exposure modeling need to be explained too. The PK data, uh, whether it is accompanied with the ECG data or not. And the same is true for human. The beta that I just mentioned previously is something you can find from this question. Uh, QT prolongation here, you can see it goes up. You can see the slope. You can see 0 0.005. When it goes up, QT prolongation is very clear. So we didn't have this kind of data before. Here, the RR. There can be two cases that we can think about, heart rate and RR. Heart rate and the RR, with these two, the QTC can be conducted. And if you look at them, some area, we don't have any changes. We don't see any changes. Other areas, we can see some changes. So we have to pay close attention to this, whether we have to go for RR or heart rate for correction method. The skilled animal analyst uh, need to think about it very seriously. So that's important. And based on that value drawn from this approach, we can go forward.
because this is not yet implemented, so we utilize QTCV at this moment, but still, the data that I just generated, I don't see impact on the substance. But at 7B, the revision part here, as you can see, the uh, formula is different from what we apply at this moment. So that is discussed in the 7B. So how we need to approach to this is explained in a 7B. So MDD for each testing, RMSD, RMSE or LD, LSD, these are important goals that we want to achieve. But for me, the beta value was low, then there is no need for calculate NVD. So if it's not that much significant, we want to uh, not calculate MDD, but once this guideline is implemented later on, maybe the regulatory body may require us to describe everything here. So it depends on uh, the CROs or the pharma companies after the implementation. In vivo QT prolongation, what needs to be done is well explained what need to be reported and described. For the parameters, if you look at them here, there are so many parameters, about like 10 parameters, including uh, temperature QTCV, QTCI. The QTCV has been changed to the QCDI, MDD, LSD. So all different fa uh, factors need to be included, meaning that we have more parameters. And the data, TK without TK or PK, then we need to have include have to include them too. This is the pro arrhythmia model. There are six general principles, but actually, frankly speaking, even I cannot understand very fully uh, this one because I'm not a mathematician and AI expert. So I'm very sorry on this point. In order to come out with the data here, we need to have this. If you uh, read this, the developer actually uh, need to provide this. This is the responsibility of the sponsor, but even in that case, this data need to be a part of the GLP study or Rudy model approved by the FDA. Currently, the version is the 1.1. So Ohara Ruby model need to be utilized to generate this. More than eight drugs here. Threshold 1, 2 drugs are shown in this screen. The Seattle or the pharma companies need this kind of the data. When we have these data information like this one for each drug, whether this uh, falls into this category or this band, then this organization, the CRO, the pharma companies are doing very well in terms of the data generation for this. Otherwise, you need to do some practice. So it's all about like repositioning because what we do have to hug test and then there is a drop. I mentioned the Eli Arulli personnel that I saw in the Vancouver conference, and he was so enthusiastic about the hug testing. And he said that he didn't have any experience or any struggles, problems, by utilizing that model in developing a drug. But here, as you can see, let's say there is an inhibition in hug, and then we call it as a good one, good candidate, but it's already, it's, suddenly it's dropped. So the drug is very effective for a certain disease then do we have to carry on with that drug or not? It can be first in class or best in class. 
So repositioning is the one in here. Even though the drug is dropped, it's an in vitro say. Because of that, the drug cannot proceed to the in vivo because it was dropped in the in vitro. That is a quite common experience uh, by the pharma companies. So one project can be just closed because of this kind of a case. It wasn't our uh, fault. However, the curve is all inhibited in that HERC model. But the efficacy study, even the efficacy was studied by the development team at the company. And they come to us for the screening, but there were no way for us to help them. But still, we felt very sorry for them. So here, if we are very good at this, the first-in-class or the best-in-class drugs can be developed more if you are able to do this kind of analysis more. But it's only a starting point. And if you look at this journal, uh, the more details can be found. I only have nine more minutes. I don't know if I'll be able to cover all the case studies. Oh, actually, I need 20 minutes, not nine minutes. Uh, my apologies. I will have to uh, quickly go over the uh, case studies. I think you can just read them. And generally speaking, well, uh, the QTC is usually a prolongated. I mean, this is the first case where I saw no prolongation of the QTC. But if you look at the her uh, the HERG assay, that was inhibition. And this was not. This is. This is not negative. This is actually a positive QTC. So what to do with this? And so if you do NAV or MEA, well, you would uh, know uh, what to do. But in this case, we did all the experimentation. I understand that a pharma company actually uh, dropped this. And uh, given our data, uh, what well, this was uh, what showed in our data. So it's the Q -tip, uh, pro not just the QT pro uh, prolongation. We have to look at other things. Uh, they feel a potential uh, duration uh, that sometimes is short. And this is the same concept as the QT. And so that has actually uh, decreased. And as for uh, the second question or the second case, there was a prolongation of the QT, but there was no difference when it came to HERG uh, assay. And uh, MFDS uh, told me, uh, according to the letter that they have sent me, in the clinical uh, trials, uh, the Q there is a need to look at the QT of uh, people uh, more closely. Uh, so if this works, that means that we have to do uh, uh, quite uh, other things as well. And so maybe you need to do ju not just the HERG, but also other t assays. But anyway, that's my personal opinion. And the third uh, study case or case study, and this is uh, related the preliminary test of the ICs. And uh, recently, we we have received many insoluble uh, test articles, and I mean there was not really a way for us to do uh, the ex uh, experimentation. And so, to we have sent a long letter to uh, the uh, Society of Pharmacology in the United States, and uh, we have asked what they thought about this. And I think there is a much difference among the regulatory organization. If there is no analysis that is done with the non-soluble uh, materials, we would drop this. But that is not the case of the FDA, and FDA is uh, still interested, and they want to see how much inhibition is done and how much uh, s uh, solution that is uh, in the solubles. And that's they were interested in EU and in the United States. But in Korea, well, if we cannot do the analysis of the components, well, if we have to for the animal tests, uh, I mean, do we have to look at the CB uh, values in the bio uh, distribution uh, tests? And if that is like uh, 15 percent, uh, can we uh, assume the same number as the uh, the CBs? So for the, if you have uh, some experience related to non-solubles, then 
you could look at the CB values. So if you could apply the CB values, so how should I explain uh, this? Maybe you could uh, plus do the uh, uh, plus twenty, not you know give give a uh, twenty five or thirty percent. If for the non soluble, if you want hundred percent micromolar, but with the anti solution, it would drop to ten micromolar, and so we don't know which would be suspended in the solutions. Anyway, when the uh, analysis is done, and then that process of the analysis shows uh, proves the similar uh, results, then uh, that data uh, could be utilized for the f uh, the further uh, studies. And if you're interested in here uh, in this thing, and if you have a similar experience. And there are many safety pharmacologists in the world. If you could share your experience uh, or your difficulties, maybe you could get the answers. And the last one is about the combined toxicity study with the SP studies. And you need to, uh, this is the textbook. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if, I'm not really promoting this. Uh, this is a, a textbook that is close to uh, the next edition. So uh, that is why I am uh, I'm showing you uh, this textbook. So uh, read through this textbook, it could be quite uh, helpful, uh, useful. And Dr. Uh, Zivindin in 1970s first mentioned this, and he has talks about as uh, uh, regulated drivers were S6, S9, and now S13. And so it talks about, you know, what a uh, safety pharmacology could do. And, and this is one lab. And that uh, this is what the Charles River is currently doing. But we're not doing like this because pharmacology, a safety test has to be done in a very quiet place. And so you do have to have very thick panels uh, uh, that surround the lab. Here they have this one lab, so they do testing here. And then you know if you need another animal, that you would go to another location within the lab. But uh, for us, uh, we need to have the animals you know enter and leave the lab. Well, of course, with that we need the approval documents, and this would uh, uh, cause a stress uh, for the animals. And this is not really healthy for the animal, of course. And so, uh, and so here. Uh, they describe the challenges, opportunities with two uh, figures A and B. About non-rodent uh, animals, it could be easier. And in Korea, we talk about the validation of the jack, uh, jacket, but SOT and other safety, uh, pharmacology safety uh, societies, uh, the, the jackets are well uh, validated and the measurements are quite accurate. But sometimes the BP is not measured. They use cough. You know the coughs. I'm sure you see it in hospitals. And so uh, the animals will be. I mean, this is, will be placed on on the tails, and so and the, the cops will break easily because they are on the tails. But with this, if you look at the C max and T max, that's what we need to look at. And in the uh, so what uh, we can do the continuous measurements. But if depending on the, how the cops are moving, then the measurement will be done differently. And so the data well, that we get from these cops. Well, we do not we know how they are engaged with the ECGs, and about the TQT uh, data uh, can still be uh, be extracted, and so with the telemetry studies, with the repetitive uh, toxicology studies, uh, uh, could be used in the, the repetitive uh, toxicology studies with. And when would we would we do this uh, test? It says it's supposed to do this on day two because on day one you have to draw blood and so quite busy, and therefore, in so the of the safety of pharmacology, well, you have to measure this before and after the the dosing. However, uh, that is why it would be possible to do this in day two.
And so uh, day one uh, would be quite busy and it's not easy to uh, do the measurement. And it would be better to get the measurements on day two. And as for the time points, so the CMAX and time math, uh, TMAX and the points uh, before and after such uh, points uh, would should be enough. And it's all described in, in the textbooks. Um, Professor Kim Dong Wan, uh, uh, you're here, but it's not easy to do in Korea. And this would be case, uh, different case by case of each chemical involved. And this is a standalone test, but we could still uh, combine these uh, uh, tests together. And this is the summary. And there are two uh, textbooks here. And I have uh, referred to uh, this advanced issue of resolution in safety pharmacology. And when it comes to uh, and so uh, please uh, make use of these two uh, textbooks. And this is uh, the picture of the company that I work for. Thank you.